my name is Brandon Kwa. I'm from uh, Malaysia and uh, my consultancy firm is uh, Citrus Consult. I uh, focus uh, mainly in hotels, restaurants, uh, and also on top of that, I, I own uh, five restaurants. Yeah, so I have, I have the best of the two worlds of, of uh, being, being an owner and also being a consultant. So I'm Josh Schumacher with Food Space, and uh, we're based in the Pacific Northwest, um, specifically Silicon Valley and the Boise, Idaho area of uh, the United States. Focus mostly on BNI. Having said that, um, we've done projects in pretty much all sectors. Uh, my name is Alexander Hofer. I'm the owner and founder of uh, H4014. We are based in the north of Italy, exactly in South Tyrol. And you were just outlining before how your part of the world has been affected by coronavirus. So the, the Italy was infected pretty, yeah, I would say really bad. So, in, in, but there, there are big differences between the regions. So it's not so bad in South Tyrol, which is uh, in, the, in the coast of, of Austria, pretty in the north. So, and uh, I have to say that our uh, regional government, the reaction was immediately, immediately, and they closed uh, into three days all the restaurants, all the hotels, all the ski areas. We are more ready right now than other regions of, of Italy, but of course it's, it's, it's still uh, deep in, in, in the system now, the, the province. It's not, the restart was not, uh, was not affected now. How about you, Joe, in, in your part of the world, in the US? What, what are you seeing? Um, I mean, we're starting to see a phased approach to opening. Um, having said that, uh, I don't think we've fully seen the, the worst of it yet here. Um, that's my opinion. Uh, I think um, as people start to try and go back out, we're going to see big spikes. Um, so certain states have uh, loosened the restrictions um, significantly. I mean, there are some dining rooms open in some restaurants in some states. Um, and, you know, as you might imagine, uh, the, the American people want to flock to those places very, very quickly. Um, and then they get overrun. And then, you know, so it's, that's kind of what's going on. Um, I, I think that it's going to take months um, of kind of slowly easing into how we reopen. Look, the damage has been done, right? Everybody's been shut down. Everybody's done what, you know, the, the, we've ripped the Band-Aid already. So now it's time to slowly repair and rebuild. Um, I think that's, that's kind of where we're, where we're at. But it's time to do that now. Brandon, how about uh, Malaysia and, and the surrounding areas? What, what are you seeing there? Well, I, I would I would have to commend that uh, our governments have been very cautious in in uh, handling the case uh, I mean this whole entire pandemic. For Malaysia, we have been locked down since uh, 18th of March, and uh, every two weeks the prime minister will come out and he makes an announcement, and we, we just get it just gets extended. For Malaysia, we have been seeing um, the curve has been flattened through this uh, exercise no businesses were allowed for at least one month. We have only started um, going back to office last week, uh, but we have uh, a strict protocol to actually uh, adhere to. Um, so for Malaysia, it's been pretty good. Uh, mm -hmm. For Singapore, uh, for, me, for me, that's my personal view. It's, I'm, I'm a bit worried for them because um, every day I'm seeing reports that uh, there's five, 600 or 700 cases reported every single day. Between the four of us, we're all at very different stages of, of this process. And is it premature to even talk about what comes next? Uh, no, I don't think it is. I think it's time. You know, the problem with this pandemic is that it's different in different places. Across the US, there's different levels and different degrees of what's happening, right? Like obviously New York's been hit very hard. You know, your major metropolitan areas have been hit harder. And yet the San Francisco Bay Area, um, they acted quickly and, and they've really done a good job of flattening the curve. As things start to open up, it's going to be very micromanaged in different areas. Um, and so I think what's interesting about what we do is we can start thinking about those plans. Um, so like we just put out, uh, you know, our guide to reopening the galaxy. We're having a little bit of fun with it, but basically our thought process is, is 
we need to build a plan right now. We need to start working on that plan based on the information that we have. We know that in these phased approaches to reopening, there's going to be social distancing. There's going to be an increased sort of hygiene level required in the dining rooms. Um, we know that self-service buffets aren't going to be allowed to get open right away, right? Um, mm -hmm. So if we can start preparing and planning that right now and help individual operators and restaurateurs start to write their specific plan for their physical space, right? So um, as an example, you know, the U.S. government put out sort of this three and four step phased approach to reopening. And most states and most governors have kind of mimicked that plan to some extent. So we know in phase two, when restaurants are allowed to start reopening in most cases, we know that they're only going to allow 25 or 50 percent of the dining capacity of what they had before. Um, so it wouldn't be hard to start writing a plan now to those capacities, um, thinking about where we're getting PPE, reaching out to our vendors and thinking about what, you know, do we need hand sanitizing stations for the dining room? Do we need some sort of thermometer to do temperature checks on the way in the door? So whatever these requirements might be, we're starting to see what those are. Consultants are maybe a little slow to react sometimes. And I think it's time for us to just, we should be leading. Of course we have in this in this period, we have a lot of problems to resolve, and we are in, so many people are in trouble. But of course, there are big chances in this period. I, I would consider me lucky, so uh, and my company, because eight weeks or nine weeks ago, um, when so many projects uh, was kept uh, on on hold on and. We we've been in trouble. We didn't know what how it how it how it going on. Mm. Uh, what's, what's going on? It's not just about our company, but it's about all all the tourism, all the hospitality, all the, the restaurants, and and all the employers which are in. And 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 two weeks after, we have all this long term project, this resource which get get open 22, 23, 24. We put out again their plans and which goes really deep uh, deep in 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 so many questions how they want to manage their resource and we have a high quality on on all these consulting points so you see there are there are people and investors in this situation where have even more quality in this in the projects which they will make in the future and they have the power especially the the financial liquidity to 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 still stay positive and to to believe that the the humanity will find a solution for this um, problem in, in a vaccination whatever I don't know so of course we have a lot of problems on restaurants uh, especially on on bars and restaurants and and hospitality structure which has to pay the rent the mm. rent and which has high costs. So what what they do right now in this? So I would say it's it's really for someone it's really unfair this situation, and for somewhere it's really I would say a, a good time too because now you have the time to consider so many points and aspects which which in the usually daily busy you didn't. Brandon, Joe was saying before um, talk, mentioning about the, the possible requirements that are going to be implemented such as uh, temperature checks or PPE being worn by staff or what have you. Is that something that you have seen in your region as some places have started to open slowly? It is part of a the SOP that has been set by the Ministry of Health that uh, for all restaurants, okay, so we go from, from, from an individual, as an individual, if you were to step up from home, mm. uh, you, you, are, you are advised to put on a mask. You, right. you have to put a mask on to go anywhere you want. And, uh, and if you want to dine into a restaurant, you need to have your details recorded. So you have to give your identification number, your contact number, your address, yeah, and then uh, get your temperature taken, mm. so, so that there's uh, there's in, enough information to do um, all this uh, tracking. You know, in, in case that there is a there is an outbreak or there's a case uh, that has happened in a in a certain place, um, and then from on the premises side, uh, the the practice of social distancing is there. Uh, you you need to have at least one meter uh, apart physically from each other. And for uh, for dining, 
um, the tables, the tape uh, has to be separated uh, by two meters. Okay. So, so these are these are already um, written in the SOP that's required for us to actually abide by. And if it's for if it's like a long table, a long communal table, uh, then we we still need to also just do markings on the the chair or on the floor to indicate like you need to you need to actually distance yourself you know from from each other by this. I mean, how would that go down in in the US? Do you do you think that's something that will happen? I think it has to happen um, in terms of how it's implemented and what the pushback is from from the citizens. I mean, that's a whole different kind of political conversation, right? <laughs> I, I, I think I think certain states and certain groups of people have been more sort of you know accommodating to the process of the government figuring out what to do, and I think other people have been like you know just sort of you know oh, this is just more regulation. The U.S. has scrambled hard to try and figure out the financial side of this, like PPP loans and um, you know bailout and all these other things. But I don't think our government has done an amazing job of giving us resources to actually govern reopening. Um, that, that has not been crystal clear. It has not been well executed. So um, definitely contrast to Brandon and, and Alexander yeah. in that way. Um, Alexandra, sure. I'm interested to hear your view on, so the things that Brandon was explaining about taking people's addresses and temperature checks and taking out tables and what have you, how will hospitality adapt to this? Of course, that's, that's the main, that's the key right now to, to, get, to put the restart, no? Because, uh, but honestly, we don't know if all these the things will have the right consequences no? to help us in long term. So it's pretty the same here than, um, than Brandon said before. We have the two meters, exactly the same. Mm. We have not the, um, that we have to give the, the, all, the, all the, the contacts and the addresses for tracking. Mm. Because it's, you know, it's um, in Europe, especially in Italy, in Germany, there, um, yeah, it's a high sensibility about your your own your own dates, and, and uh, there are two kinds of peoples. No, there are people which are still scared about everything, and the other one which are like going against the politicals uh, because they're seeing in everything like. Uh, something fake no some some story based uh, now here on the earth to to get our life even harder no so and uh, it's it's um, it's traumatically this situation and it, it scares me a little bit no because uh, with m missing money this can really create some some bad situation between the yeah. people and, and and when you have this you don't have you don't have guests. So do you think, how do you think people will react to going into a restaurant once we can do that and the, the waiter or the sommelier come up wearing a face mask and... We, we start, we start this week and, and there was a lot of discussion, discussions about the rules. Yeah, then you have to put on the mask and no, we can't have the, our guests will not respect it, it will not allow to do that with them. It's not true because the, to 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 have the mask on in this period, it's normally for the people. So uh, they they watch even bad the other people, which they don't have the mask on. So and it's all the story about the buffets, no? And the, and the, why as guests I can go with the mask on to the buffet right now? Is that so hard? It resolves all your problems on the buffet. And uh, and they and we think no, our guests they they don't. It's not vacation. You're right, but in this period, it's vacation because we have a little bit adapt as to mm. ourselves. And but the restaurants they start right now, and it's not it's not that bad. It's it's really bad in situation like bars uh, in the cities where you have low. Of course, you have in a small space you have a lot of people, and you need this turnover to pay to pay employees. You pay, you have to pay rents, which mostly in the in the cities are really high. It could happen that we really will lose uh, many, many of these bars, bars and stores and small gastronomy the next year. Yeah, and they will then reopen in a year, and, and it's set for for the situation. Brandon, I know we spoke in the past. We've spoken a little bit about um, ghost kitchens or cloud kitchens. Um, I can't remember what your preferred term is for it. 
But I mean, they have been, and I've spoken to you about it as well, Joe. Um, they have been, uh, you know, one of the—I don't want to say winners, but they have certainly experienced uh, a boom of sorts, haven't they? Yeah, I think um, we, we've been hearing a lot of people talking about cloud kitchens over the past, uh, yeah, over the past two two months. Hmm. And uh, certainly, uh, like I, what I was sharing earlier, um, during this whole entire lockdown. The food delivery sales has uh, has gone up, you know, easily. I think by three hundred percent. People are seeing that there is a shift in 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 the the way the future of uh, um, F and B businesses will be will be uh, modeled ar- around. I mean, everyone will have to start going digital. You know, you have to we have to digitize your business, and uh, and I think I think having a central like a ghost kitchen or a cent- uh, cloud kitchen will be will be interesting for for many businesses because you you will take away that initial um, startup cost that you need to have you know in 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 uh, finding a place to step to to pay rent buy equipment you know uh, all you need to do right now is just um, find find a cloud kitchen just uh, sign up for you know a, a, a nominal fee Go to go. Just get yourself registered online. Um, make make your presence available on on the delivery uh, apps, and then yeah, and then just buy well, whatever ingredients that you need. The equipments are already available for for you. You know, by from the from the kitchen itself, or or maybe there are some uh, business models where the set, the cloud kitchen gives you the space, or all you need is just to to invest in some equipments that you need to to to, to operate. The way I've been seeing things is everything's been funneling down into two categories. You're either food service for an experience or your food service for convenience, right? Um, so convenience is going to wrap up all of your delivery ghost kitchens that were already on the rise. And that convenience bucket was already taking market share away from, you know, traditional QSR, from traditional, you know, other traditional fast, casual, and fast food models. And so what what the pandemic's done is sort of, uh, poured gasoline on that thought process, at least temporarily. And my caution, my hesitation with that is twofold. Um, on one side of the coin, we're going to have all of these dead restaurants with this really rich inventory of equipment and infrastructure. The problem is, and, and I think both these guys have made the other point about how high rents are in, in these, especially in the retail side of the business, you know? And so, um, the challenge that we're going to have is that we're going to have all these people that think that ghost kitchens are the future and that blind delivery and contact delivery is going to be with us for a long time, which it probably will be. The question is whether or not we were already growing that segment. And so if the growth continues on the rate that it was on, are we going to be oversaturated already? That's the question. Um, and, and I think it's going to be it's going to be a year or more before we know the answer to that. You know, I don't want to like hesitate or, you know, throw up the, the brakes for people that want to come into the industry and invest. But on the same token, um, you know, that might be a little short sighted. Alexander, you mentioned uh, before briefly uh, buffets. Um, and that's something that has been talked about quite a lot. I mean, will COVID-19 spell the end of buffets or is there a way to have a buffet safely? It, it is changing just for a rule. Or is it changing because the because people don't uh, don't uh, want it anymore? No, it's it's different. No, if it's coming from the from the guest, or it's is coming because it's not allowed anymore. And I can't right now. I can't not imagine that uh, it's 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 over with buffets. I I don't believe that. I don't believe that. And that the other at the other end, I. I can't even believe that um, um, that we close the whole food right now in in uh, in um, between, so like after glass and so. But the question it's it's a good question you make, but it's it's hard to answer right now. Yeah, I think the buffet is in a coma right now, right? Like I think the buffet is on hold, and in the U.S., uh, the the margins that these businesses are running on are so tight and so low that self-service was also a way to help boost profitability. 
because you're lowering your labor costs by providing the, you know, by having the guests do some of the work, especially in non-commercial, right? So, um, and so the problem is that a lot of these facilities were set up with some hybrids, right? Where they have some self-service and some full service. And, and a lot of that was because of the margins. And so the question becomes, does with all the restaurants that will unfortunately never reopen, um, the talent pool that will exist, um, are we going to be able to get people to pay more money for the type of service that COVID would require us to supply? Meaning turning a, a self-service area into full service is very expensive from an operational standpoint, not the physical part, right? Like we can, we could have a server making a plate on a self-service buffet. There's not, maybe it doesn't look as good and it wouldn't have been the right way to design it from the beginning, but there's nothing that says I couldn't have a server on a salad bar making somebody a custom salad and handing it to them. But that doesn't solve the bigger issue, which is over time, people are social and habitual and they like certain things certain ways. And I think um, the buffet is part of that. It's part of culture. It's part of the social part of it. It's if you think of certain industries, right? Like casino industry, the cruise ship industry, uh, hospitality in general, like hotels, like buffets are a, a staple. Right. Um, long term, I think it's about solving the issue of COVID, having vaccines, having contact tracing, having, um, you know, herd immunity eventually, right? Like whatever the things are that will eventually make us get back to quote unquote normal. Um, the unfortunate thing is the buffet is likely in a coma until that point. At least that's how I see it. But I wonder if I can just finish on perhaps a slightly more positive note. Um, Alexander, you hinted at it a little bit. Is this a, an, a good opportunity to actually reflect a little bit about how we run the industry, if there are areas that could be improved. Um, what do you think? I mean, you said a little bit that you've used this time to reflect a little bit. Yeah, totally. I, I believe in that. Uh, yeah, totally. I think we, it, uh, especially in the host industry, in the hotels, we, we will come um, we, we need digitalization. We said it before, of course, that's no question. But I think we have to go back to have some processes more analog anymore, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and we have to, to think again that especially now our guest, which, put, which writes us an email that he wants to come for vacation, why I don't should get the, the, the phone in the hand and I give him a call? Yeah. And we, we speak, we speak just five minutes and we spend a good time and, and I'm really happy. So I never felt like the last weeks that you, you phone customers and cost, customer phone you and they ask really, hey, how are you? And the answer was interesting by them. It wasn't not just a question, how are you, just to make the question. And you feel that now that people is really happy to, to, to hear that you get, that you are healthy. That, that you have a that you're having a good time and i think this is a a new quality of relationship you know which we have especially in this in this um in our in our hospitality and uh, that's important because the first thing we all we are looking for right now is the, the security that we have back the security and that we can trust again in, in, in our life, in our, in, our ba in our daily life, and that we can go on vacation, that we can go in a bar, that we can go in a restaurant, and that we can have back some little part of normality in this life. And so I think it, we have a good chance to, yeah. on this important, on the relationships, to cool down a little bit from this hurry, from this fast time, and that we get, uh, again, a little more analog on this side, and that we see all that the rest of, of the business important and as help, uh, but not that the digitalization is replaced the humanity. I think there is a high potential in that in this time, yeah. But what are your thoughts on that, Brandon? Uh, do, do you think that this is a good time for, for operators and I guess consultants, but also diners to reflect on what hospitality means to us all? Well, I, I do echo what uh, Alexander has just shared. 
we definitely will see a, a, a change in approach uh, on, on dining because of this whole entire pandemic until we see a vaccine that's, uh, that could really just give us that confidence that you can just go out normally again. Um, but otherwise, it will change the dynamics of dining. Um, but at the same time, I think it has also given us that opportunity to just reflect on on uh, on life, on how we look at life, how we do life together, and uh, I see I see that the that that the community will become stronger. Actually, um, we 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 are actually trying to support each other to make sure that you know we can pull through this together. And I'm I'm positive that if we can get through this uh, this whole entire pandemic and the the, cri- the economic crisis um, this year, next year will, will be better. I mean, I hate to say the, I hate to say it this way, but I hope you take advantage of that. One thing that's very different between Europe and here, especially, is that a lot of food service workers here have always been looked at as the help. You know, we're just the the bus boys and the dishwashers and the servers are just the help. Um, it's never been a career path. It's never been a, oh, I'm going to go make a career out of the restaurant business like that. People aren't in school thinking about that. And what I hope this does. Um, in the U.S. is really drive people to think about those workers and think about, you know, what they do and how hard they work and the effort, you know, that it takes to even just open a restaurant and serve food to people, right? And the risk and the, um, you know, it, it, it's such a passion-driven business and it's either, you either have the bug or you don't. And the problem is, at least in the U.S., a lot of the people that didn't have the bug didn't mean they weren't foodies didn't mean that they didn't have high expectations, but they didn't understand it. And I think this has opened a lot of people's eyes. Um, You know, when you start hearing the statistics that 30 or 40% of these restaurants are never going to reopen. I mean, that's a, that it's, it's crazy. Um, You know, and everybody knows somebody, everybody in the world knows somebody that's been affected by this. This has not happened before. I mean, even in 1918 with, you know, the quote unquote, the last pandemics that are on record, like the way that we communicate, the media, the number of people in the world, totally different, right? Like this is a totally different experience. Um, So, I mean, Tina, I hope, I hope that uh, at least here in the U.S., I hope that people realize um, the effort that the food industry puts out there to, to serve what we do. Well, on that note, um, I want to say thank you to you all, to Joe, Alexander, and Brandon for taking the time to take part in this. Um, I hope it was useful for you. And obviously, thanks to Hoshisaki for supporting us in this. And um, well, until next time, I wish you all the best, the three of you, and stay safe. <laughs>